Ephesians chapter 5. Thank you, God, for your presence in this place, Lord. Thank you, God, for an open heaven, Lord. Eh? We ask you, Father God, to let it rain in this place, God. Let it rain healing. Let it rain deliverance, Lord. We praise you and we thank you, Father God. We give you all glory, honor, because you, Lord, alone are worthy, Father. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to begin in verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Father God, I thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you, God, that you are a faithful God. Lord, that you are able to perform that which you have promised. Father, I thank you that every word, Lord God, every seed that you have planted in this earth, Father God, in every person, Father, God will not return unto you void, God, but they will accomplish that, Father God, for which you have sent them, Father. And God, I thank you, Lord, for your plans are perfect, Lord, even when we don't understand it. So, Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. Lord, many are in a place, Lord God, where there's a crossroads, Father. They're walking through a hallway, Father, and there is a door set before them, and they might not be able to interpret the door, and they might not be able to, to know how to move on. So tonight, Father God, I ask you, let your word go forth. Let it go forth like seed, Father. Let it not return unto you void, God. Let it accomplish for which you have sent it, God. Let it bring understanding. Let it bring clarity, God. Let it bring correction, Father God, which would put us in the right direction, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Father God, for your plans and your purposes. God, I thank you that your word will stand forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word, Lord God, will never pass away. I thank you tonight that your word, God, is the anchor that holds holds us together in the midst of the storm, God, while we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that we don't have to fear evil, Father God, because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are with us, Lord. And like Paul declared, God, I know that my Redeemer lives, Father God. So Lord, we just ask you tonight to move by your Spirit, Lord, to speak to us, God. Lord, bring clarity where there's been confusion, Father God. Lord, speak peace tonight, Lord God, where there's been unsettling, Father God. I thank you, Lord God. I pray for those, Lord, who have read restless nights sleep, Father God. Lord, I pray, God, that when they awake in the middle of the night, God, that it would be your word that they would hear, Father God. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, for peace, Lord God, for every bondage broken, Lord God, every yoke destroyed in this place. Lord, remove every distraction, remove every spirit of hindrance in this place. Help us, Lord God, to focus on you, Lord, to hear your voice, Father. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, just as a reminder, I am so excited. Our One Day Women's Conference is this Saturday at the Hilton Garden Inn in Stony Brook. Tickets are $50. There is still uh, some room available. However, it is the biggest sign-up that we've ever had. So thank you all for coming out. But ladies, you do not want to miss it. Uh, the $50, it covers uh, lunch and breakfast, two worship services, conference materials, and a move of God, which I guarantee you, you will not leave the same way that you walked in. Uh, so if you uh, have not uh, signed up and you are wanting to, don't waste a moment. Don't miss a door. Be there. You can either sign up with Janine or you can go online tonight and, and sign up through, um, through online by by my website. But I am <clears throat> I am myself being so encouraged by this new series Hallways. Uh, God is really speaking to me and I have to tell you that um, when I pray and I pray for people there is such a heaviness that uh, of 
of intercession that I feel and and I could tell you that as I've been praying I've been praying for us corporately but I've been praying for everyone individually and you know when you intercede for someone God will uh, allow you to feel what they're feeling and in my spirit, I feel that there really is a heaviness. I feel that there is a, a desperateness that is going on with people. And some people are, are like, I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm doing the best I can. But, you know, I got to tell you, Pastor Karen, it, it's, it's rough. And the Lord wanted me to just to tell you and to remind you, no matter what it feels, no matter what it looks like, I am here. I am working on your behalf, and I am going to do what I promised. What I promised you, I am going to do in your life. I have got it under control. Just trust me, says the Lord. But he wants you to know how much that he loves you. And when he said, I'll never leave you, and I will never forsake you, and that nothing can separate you from his love, I don't care what you go through. I don't care, you know, how many bad choices you've made. Nothing can separate you from his love. It has been his love that has kept you and has brought you this far. Amen. You are, you are tight in the stronghold grip of God. He says, I will not let you go. Your face has been etched in the palm of my hand. You are ever before me, says the Lord. And he loves you tonight. And he gave me the title of this message. And I think that this is something that we can all relate to. Um, we might not want to admit it, but we all go through it. And God gave me the title, Did I Miss It? Did I Miss It? Backtracking Through the Hallways. There is one question I think that we all ask and if you've been walking with the Lord long enough, um, and for any length of time, there is one question that at some point or another we will all ask ourselves. Can this really be God? Can this really be God? Did I miss it? Did I take a wrong turn? And how do I recover from this? Anybody in that place? Is this really God? Because you know what? The path never, ever looks like the promise. And that's why God tells us all the time that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. I know that we all know that scripture that he says, my ways are not your ways. They're higher than your ways. And we understand it and we can know it. But sometimes accepting that and living with that can be a completely different thing. Amen? Uh, we were sharing in the back, and we know that God knows more. We know that God is in control, but sometimes our flesh just kind of gets in there and says, you know, God, if you need some help, if, if you'd like some advice, um, you know, I just want to tell you, maybe you want to try this. Um, but I thank God that we serve a God that does not need our help all he needs really is our yes. Amen? Because all he's looking for is a willing vessel that will say, Lord, I surrender all to you. Please, Lord, have your will in my life. Um, I spoke on Sunday about interpreting the different uh, doors that are in front of us. We don't have the tape tonight, but we will have it um, by next week. And I talked about there are four doors uh, that you will constantly find yourself in front of. One is a closed door, a locked door. And that is a door that is shut and that we are not supposed to open up. It's, it's one that has a big red stop sign on it that says, do not go there, that there is danger. You'll also find a door in your hallway that is closed, but yet it's unlocked. And that door represents the promises of God. And they're all yours, and you have access to them. It's just not the right time yet. It's not the appointed time. And then there's the door that is open just a little bit. There's a crack in the door. 
And when you get to that door, it, what, what, what that door is saying is, listen, we're not quite in the promised land, but now you're beginning your process into that place. So walk slowly and be cautious how you walk. Uh, because this door is going to lead to the promised land, but we're not quite at the promised land yet. And then there is the last door, and that is the completely open door where God says, this is it, this is your time, this is your season, now you're ready, this, the atmosphere has been set, so now go in and possess the land. Um, and, the, and I talked about it in detail, so you can probably see it on YouTube and, and, and get the CD so you'll, you'll understand that. Um, uh, a live a, a little bit better and some might have even said you know this is great but somehow I feel like maybe that message came into my life a little bit too late you know where was this message years ago when those doors were open to me and maybe I chose the wrong door or maybe I went through the door and I did it the wrong way and somehow I feel like I have missed God. Has anybody ever felt that way? Can you really, um, can you really miss God? And can you really go through a wrong door? And the Bible says that man can make his plans, but his footsteps are ordered by God. So we talk a lot about destiny and we talk a lot about promise, but sometimes I think we misunderstand what destiny really is. And destiny has nothing to do with your or, or my desire of what we want to do. Destiny is all about what God has called and purposed you to do. Each and every one of us was a word spoken by God. The Bible says, and I pray this all the time, that the word is seed and it goes forth and it won't return void. So each and every one of us are a word that became a seed that God planted in this earth with a specific purpose and a specific plan. The Bible says, do not be deceived because God will not be mocked. In other words, don't fool yourself because God will never be found wrong. He will never be made a fool of. He will never be caught not keeping or, pro or performing something that he has promised. If God has truly said it, God will bring it to pass because he is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. God did not haphazardly create you. When he created you, before you were in your mother's womb, he knew you. He had a plan for you. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is writing and he has written the chapters of your book. He knows the beginning from the end. He's written the story. He's read the story. He knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. The only problem is that we have not read the entire book. We might have skimmed through it and know where we were, and we might know where God's promised us to be, but right now we're in those middle chapters. And it's kind of like a suspense novel where we're reading this and you're saying, oh, this is a really bad chapter. I don't want to stay here. And so what you got to do is you just got to keep turning the pages. You just got to keep reading it. You can't put the book down. And you can't add anything to the book. God says, I have ordered your steps. And because I've ordered your steps, and because before you were in your mother's womb, and I knew you, God knitted us together. He knows how we think. 
You know, believe it or not, even though we're all human beings, our brains don't always work the same way. And I can tell you being a preacher that, you know, if I sit in this room and, and, and there's 50 people in this room and I say one comment, 50 people have the ability to walk away with a different interpretation of the same sentence. I can say something and somebody can take it as life. Somebody will take it as confirmation. Somebody will take it as that's gossip. Somebody won't like it. There's all kinds of ways that people can interpret things. You can make your plans, but God says, I've ordered your steps. I've put you together. I knew what you were going to do before you did it. While you were yet in your sin, because God created you and he spoke something over you, Christ died for you to deal with all the mistakes that you would ever make in your life. He put the mistakes in the chapters. That's why God is not thrown off course. And you don't see God when we make a mistake running to a corner and crying and saying, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? Because he knows how he put you together. God knows how to speak to you. God knows how to speak to you when you are at your lowest. You know, everybody is different. God uses a different tool on every person. You know, my husband's an electrician and my husband is very handy with tools. I, on the other hand, am not. And the one pet peeve that I, well, I have a lot of pet peeves my husband has with me um, when, it, when it comes to doing things around the house. And, and listen, I, I'm not, I'm not, I love to, to help out where I can. And I have this really, really bad habit that, and it's a pet peeve when the light fixtures, you know, the light plates are, are off the walls. I hate that. It drives me nuts. And many times I don't know where his tools are. So I will pick up the light plate and I will find a screw and I will go to my favorite tool that I always use and that is a butter knife. <laughs> and I, oh, you guys use butter knives too? Okay. And every time my husband sees me doing that, I could tell it's like the Holy Spirit is in him and he's using self-control, but he's like, don't, don't do that. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. And uh, now here's the thing. The, 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 the butter knife is a tool that works for me, but it won't work for him, but yet it can accomplish on a light switch the same thing. <laughs> it will accomplish, it will get the plate on the wall. I've never electro electrocuted myself, praise the Lord. It's all worked out fine. But the butter knife, it won't work for him. And so what God does is God will bring us to the same place. He will perform his promise, but he will use different tools. He will use different things to be able to relate to us. Why? Because, you know, sometimes I might be a little bit gabados and I might be tough. And I might flourish under a tougher teacher. You ever see that new, that new uh, reality series, Dance Moms? Okay, everybody doesn't like Abby Lay Miller. They think that she's so mean, that she's so this and she's so that, and she's cruel to all these kids because she's not soft and cuddly and she's not, you know, she's not this nurturing thing. I happen to think that she is the greatest coach I've ever seen. Why? Because I understand that there is a method behind that madness. I understand, first of all, she's not those kids' mother. She is their teacher. She understands, hey, these kids are going into a, a, a career that you better be the one under, out of a thousand. She understands that these girls, these young girls, are going to hear the word no more than they're ever going to hear the word yes. And she knows that she's got to be tough on them and she's got to build some backbone in them because emotionally and psychologically, when they get out into the real world, they're not going to be able to stand up against the constant rejection.
Because when you are in the arts and you are in the theater, you are going to experience much more rejection than you ever do the accept the acceptance. You're going to hear the word no more than you hear the word yes. And so I look at her and I see I would flourish under a teacher like that. Why? Because that would get me going to say, okay, I'm going to do better now. But some personalities can't handle that. But it doesn't make Abby Lee a bad teacher. And it, because when you see certain parts of her, she's got a soft side. Because when the kids win, or the kids get to do what she's taught them to do, and they get it for themselves, you can see her stepping back, and by herself, she enjoys it. And the children know that when they get the nod from the teacher, they have really, really accomplished something. Because if they got told all the time how wonderful and how this and how that and, and, and held them all the time, it's not going to mean anything. Amen? Amen? So all my point is to say that is that God will use different things in our life in different ways. And so we have to be careful that when we're walking through life and when God is doing something, that we understand that this, God is going to speak to you the way you are going to be able to receive it. Can you say amen? So when you go through that door, um, destiny, it, it, it's, it's not about our desire, it's about our future. God created you with a purpose. He created you with divine intention, and wherever there is divine intention, there is always divine intervention. That's why he boldly declares that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. He divinely, uh, he divinely invented you. He created you. So he knows, he knows everything from the beginning, from the end. So, um, I was at a funeral this week. And it was a difficult funeral with me because, again, there were all of these people from my past. And it is amazing the way you can come out of something and that God will allow you to come back to some things. And it's easy to put the past behind you if you never have to see it. Amen? So I have to tell you that when I got there and I was, I was very apprehensive going, but I prayed and I went to this funeral and, and here I am, and I come face to face with someone who I had a rough past with. Somebody who, who really, really, really hurt me. And they came up to me, and they said to me, Karen, I should have listened to you. And they looked at me again, and they pointed their finger, and they said, Karen, I should have listened to you. And I remembered right away what, the, what they should have listened to about. And, you know, in that moment, I realized something. I realized just how much God has done a work in my life. I understood at that point, wow, I have really, really grown in God. Now, being a woman... You know we love to be right. I took absolutely no satisfaction in it whatsoever. Because I knew what I had told them. It came from God. I knew that it was the truth, but I knew that it sounded so outlandish. And you know what? I was rejected, and, and, and people came against me because of it. And when he said that to me, I should have listened to you. My heart sank. My heart just sank. And I said to them, I said, listen, God will work all things, all things for good. And when I left the funeral home, I got to tell you, my heart was so heavy and was so broken for this person. Because not only did their mistake of not listening affect them, but it affected everybody else 
around them. And, and I was so grateful to God because I realized that going through the hurt that I did and going through the different trials and, and tribulations that I had, it gave me compassion for others. God's given me an ability now to love like I was never able to love. Because if it would have happened probably 10 years ago, there would have been something said, oh, yeah, see, see, I told you. There would have been a self-righteous thing. But it's been through all the breaking. It's been through all the pain. It's been through all the processing. That Because God showed me mercy and God touched my heart that now I can look beyond somebody's fault and I can see their need. And so um, I have to tell you that it's an amazing thing because whenever Satan tries to hurt you with your past, God is letting you know I am dealing with your future. So sometimes when, when, when we, you know, and everybody asks me all this time, but I thought I forgave them, but yet when I come up to somebody who hurt me, I, I, still, feel, I still feel the rush of emotion. Listen, the rush of emotion was there. When I walked in that room, I remembered what I had gone through. But when I spoke to them, I realized I might have my emotion, but my heart, my heart was healed. And when you can minister out of healing, you know that you are ready to go to the next level. That's why I encourage you, be very careful when you're going through something, who you talk to and who you counsel with to make sure that the person is talking out of healing and they are not talking out of their bitterness. Because if you're talking out of bitterness, you're not ministering healing. You can be giving warning, and you might be giving good counsel, but you can't counsel so much out of your experience if you're not completely healed. Because until you're healed, then you know the whole entire story. Can you say amen? So it was at that moment um, that, I, that I realized that there was a change that had gone in me. I realized that, you know what, this is why I can, I can thank God for every mountain. Because every day we pray, God, make me more like you. Jesus was able to forgive those who killed him on the cross. As he was being nailed to the cross, Jesus said, forgive him, Father, for they know not what they do. The Bible says that he takes us from glory to glory to glory. And I realized to love my enemy and to be sorry for him was the evidence that God has done something in me. So I could not get this, this situation out of my head. And, and, I, and when, I, when I went home, I, I began, um, I, there's nothing I could say. There was nothing I could do. And all I could do was just get on my knees and pray. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw this person's face before me. Um, and what is amazing about God is that when you start to pray for someone else, especially your enemies, God will begin to answer questions that you've had about your own life. My prayer started out, please help, help him and give him and surround him with peace. But then my prayer turned into a conversation with God. And, and I began to ask God, why couldn't you have kept that door I told him not to walk through? Why couldn't you have locked it? Why couldn't you have kept him from that? And sometimes, you know, and I spoke about it last Tuesday, like sometimes we, our problem is, is not, you know, sociological, it's not economical, it, it's, sometimes it's theological. Because God being so good of a God, why do you allow bad situations? Why did you allow them to bust down a door? Not to he, because you know what? They're just as much your child as I am. Why couldn't you have just blocked that thing? Because this thing was devastating. It made such a mistake. And this was God's response to me. 
God makes all things work to good, for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. God uses every situation in our life as a learning experience. The thing that we need to understand about God is that he says, I want you to see that I am in all things. When there is chaos, I'm in the chaos. And I'm the one who brings order in the chaos. I can bring good and great out of every single situation. Many times, I have to allow you to go through bad situations to allow you to have a deeper understanding of mercy and grace. We don't understand mercy and grace. We can read about it and we can intellectually understand it, but until you've ever gotten into a place where you yourself needed mercy and you needed grace, you don't understand how good mercy and grace is. So sometimes God has got to let you go through things so that you have practical knowledge of his word. You know, it's, it's like if you go to uh, medical school. You know, if you go to medical school and all they ever did was train you by reading books, how would you ever be able to learn? Because I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be the first patient that you've ever operated on if you've only read a book. <laughs> so what they do is they'll work on cadavers. They'll give them experience. And then there's, there's a long process through it that they work in the hospital and they'll, and they'll be residents and, and they'll, they'll be interns and then residents. And they go through this whole thing so that by the time that they get their, their white coats and they're ready to go, they're ready to operate. They've already had practical application. How many know that sometimes you can, you can read a book, you can read a recipe, and the recipe makes sense, you'll know what to do, but then all of a sudden, you start to put that thing together and you've never done it and it turns out to be a disaster? That sometimes you've gotta try things because you can read it in a book, but in real life, it didn't quite work out the way you wanted it to. So sometimes God's got to allow you to go through some tough things so that you can get, pract get a practical education, that you can have some application of the world, of, of, of the word, and understand, listen, I've heard this word, but how do I apply this word? You know, it was like when I was doing um, Easter cantatas and Christmas cantatas and I was writing them, I would go to different churches and the one thing that I changed about my cantata that I didn't see anybody else doing and what frustrated me about other churches was they put on this beautiful, beautiful Christmas thing. It was a great story, great music. I couldn't, I couldn't knock it at all. But my problem was everybody knows that Jesus was born of a virgin that he died on a cross and he rose again. Everybody knows that. It was the greatest story that's ever been told. The problem is, how does that relate to my life? How does that relate to my life? Because I was always somebody, I'm a hands-on learner. I gotta have my hands on something for me to really be able to understand it and own it. See, I can talk about faith. I can talk about being strong in law. I can talk about worship. Why? Because I've had so much practical experience and life application in those areas that I can tell you. How do I get through things? I worship my way through. So when I used to write the cantatas, I used to take real life situations what people were really going through, and I would try to take the story of Christmas and apply it so that the person who didn't have the relationship with God would understand that it's not just a religion, but it's a relationship. 
So God will allow you to go through some bad things at certain low levels because he knows he's taking you from glory to glory to glory so that when you go to that next, that next dimension of glory, that you are prepared, that you've got some experience with what you're doing. Understand that the prodigal son would have never known about grace and mercy if he had not left home. That son had everything that he needed in his house. But somehow he thought the grass was greener on the other side. And so he left everything. He severed relationships. He, he squandered everything. He lost everything to find his father in the same place that he left him. Sometimes you and I are got to be a prodigal son and daughter. Sometimes we've had to walk away from God. God has allowed us to willingly be disobedient and faithless. I'm not saying he made you that way. But sometimes he allows us to make certain choices because he wants to show you a life lesson. He wants to be able to prove to him, to prove to you how to teach you and how to trust you. Sometimes he says, I got to allow you to go through some difficult things because I got to teach you some humility. Because to understand, to walk in God, if you want to be the greatest, you've got to learn how to be the least. And sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're the, somebody, when you have that kind of personality that you always have to be seen, that you always have to be recognized, that you always have to be thanked, God says, I need to cut that out in you because that's not a good thing. And so God, God sometimes will allow people to completely, totally ignore you. Because what he's teaching you is, listen, I want you to do all that you do for me. Because the real lesson in that, if you're doing what you're doing to be seen and to have the approval of man, you're going to head into such a difficult place because you will never be able to please man. Men will love you one minute and they will get rid of you the next minute. But I... I see what you do in secret. I see your heart. And I will reward you openly. Don't put your trust in man. You put your trust in me because I'm the only one who will not disappoint you. I prove myself and, and who I am in your life. I prove to you through a bad situation that my arm is strong to save you. No matter what you're going through. This poor man, he cried out to him. And delivered him from all his troubles. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody, I'm going to lead you and I'm going to guide you. That even if I lead you to a difficult place, even if I lead you to the valley of death, even if I lead you into a storm, if I lead you into a hospital bed, if I lead you into a famine... I want you to know that I will be the God who will protect you, who will provide for you. I've learned who God is through my trial, not through my mountaintops. My mountaintops have been a place of respite. And then I'm off to the next dimension of glory. And he takes you from glory to glory to glory. And he uses the bad stuff in your life to train you, to equip, because every time you get to the next dimension of glory, you're a lot better. You're a lot smarter. You're a lot stronger. You don't handle things now the way you did 20 years ago. And if you did, Houston, you have a problem. You have a problem. Because with God, when you yield yourself to God and you yield yourself to this process, and no, this process is not fun. This process, there are some real difficult points in this process. But if you allow God to have his way in your life, he will prove to you who he is. That you, like Paul, will be able to say, 
I know my Redeemer lives. I know that if I'm facing this thing today, as bleak as it may seem, as horrible as it may be, as impossible as it may be, I know that God is able to see me through this thing. And here's the thing. So many times we cry for do-overs, but God does not do do-overs. God does makeovers. And so many times we find ourselves saying, oh, if I only had the chance to do that again, I would never do that. Well, the only way you would never do that again is if you entered into the same situation and your mind was renewed. Unless your mind is renewed, your life is never transformed. That's why people can sit in church for 30, 40, 50 years. And yeah, they're going to heaven, but they've been walking in the, in, around the mountain for the 40 years that they've been, they've been saved. Because they might have come out of Egypt, but their thinking is still in Egypt. Their mind has not been renewed. Maybe they got saved out of a legalistic church. Maybe they got saved out of fear and they're still walking in that same religious fear and have not learned how to enjoy the freedom of walking with God and having a relationship with him. There are some things that, that got on you in life that God is desperately getting off of you. The only reason that you think that you can do that, the only reason that you would be able to truly make a different decision is that your mind has been re renewed because you learned from the negative situation. See, sometimes people that, re the only reason why a person repeats the same mistake is because they have not learned from the mistake. They have not learned from the mistake. Because of the negative, God used the negative situation to renew your mind. Listen, he told you, don't touch the stove. You're going to get burned. Hopefully, if you went and you touched the stove, you've understood, okay, I'm never going to do that again. Your mind got renewed. And too many times what happens in our life is we try so hard to keep putting our natural on God's super and calling it supernatural. But the only way anything is really supernatural is when God puts his super on your natural. And you've got to give your natural to God. That's the only way that things ever become supernatural. If you go through something and your mind is not renewed, you are going to make the same mistake over and over and over again. It's as simple as that. But if you yield yourself to the Lord and you take the situation that the Lord has allowed you to go through, he will renew your mind and he will make you over. And that's what you want. Stop asking God for a do-over and ask God for a makeover. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. I, I, can, I can tell you that, you know, like sometimes, you know, when I was growing up in the church and, and, and sitting under different authorities, and I, I mean, I've sat under my, my, my souls. I've sat under crazy. And I tell you what, I learned from sitting under Saul and making those mistakes because you know what? I didn't like, I didn't like being hunted. I didn't like, David didn't like being chased. It's not fun. It's not fun being attacked. It's not fun being picked on. And God, finally, you know, and, and when I had to leave that place, it was a disaster. But the lessons that I learned there, I took it to the next place. And I said, never do that again. Never do that again. And I wanted freedom. I wanted freedom. I wanted to do what God called me to do. I wanted to be who God called me to be. But there was a way that I had to do it. And I had to learn how to do it. And God uses a lot of difficult situations in your life to make you over. Our first verse tonight, it said, See then that ye walk circumspectfully, 
not as fools, but as wise. The word circumspectively means to walk cautiously, with watchfulness every way, with attention to guard against surprise or danger. Its objective is to have a clear of understanding of what it means to walk circumspectly in the world. In other words, to understand why our walk as a Christian community ought to be a witness to the world. Everything that we go through in life, God is intending on us to learn something so that we can grow, so that we don't make the mistake again, so that we can be an example to people. Making a mistake can be, it can be the best thing of your life. It can be the greatest thing that's ever happened to you if you learn from it. If you learn from it. Every, every uh, successful businessman, they made the mistakes, but they'll tell you, I'm glad I made those mistakes because I learned from everything that I tried. Sometimes, I mean, when you listen to some of these stories, they failed more times than they succeeded. You only have to succeed once. You only have to have one number one hit and then you could be set for life. You only have to have one business that really takes off. God allows you to go through different things and make the mistakes. Correction will always bring direction, and God always intends to bring a message out of your mess. You know, that's why sometimes people had a real hard time with me because they think I'm a little too real. And I have a real problem with leaders who are not real. Who, who, you know, you look at them and everything is always perfect and they've never had a problem and they've, they've never gone through something and their kids are wonderful and their marriages are perfect and their health is perfect and everything is this beautiful, tight, wonderful, pretty little package. And you know, what that only tells the people sitting in the congregation is that, wow, they never had to struggle for anything. God must really love them more than he loves me. And the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Everybody gets hit with stuff. And I got news for you. The people on the front lines, it's why God says you need to pray for your leaders. One, we're held at a different standard. But two, we are on the front lines and the front lines get shot. Here I was going through a sickness. And I really, I mean, I didn't, I, honestly, one of the main reasons that I didn't tell everybody when, while I was going through it and so far in advance was, one, I needed some time that I could wrap my head around it. Forget about all you being able to accept it and be braced for it. I didn't care about that. I need, oh God, are we really going through this? How did I end up here? Didn't, 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 I, didn't I go through enough? I mean, really, how many, how many surgeries, how many deaths, how many betrayals? I mean, wh when is it like enough? When is it enough? And then, and then I struggled in my flesh. Well, I really don't want to tell everybody because I don't want everybody focusing on how is she up there preaching and then going through this. I had a lot of reasons. There was a lot of emotional stuff. Why? Because everybody that goes through that thing goes through certain things. And guess what? I wasn't exempt. I would have liked to have been. And no, it wasn't because of sin in my life. It wasn't because I had done something wrong. It wasn't because God just said, let me just bless this honor. God says, if it comes to you, don't worry about it. I'll use it. And you know that God has done such a work in my life that I'm having a hard time identifying with what I went through because what I went through is not who I am. Went to a cancer fundraiser on Saturday and they asked me just to share a little bit of the testimony and sing a song. At the end of the day, they said, come on, let's all the, all the survivors, let's get up and take a picture. And I sat in my seat. And, and they said, come on, Karen, you're a survivor. 
And I went, looks at Janine, I said, I'm a survivor. All of a sudden, I found myself like, wow, I really am part of a club. I'm part of a club that I didn't even really ask to be, and I didn't, and I didn't realize it. But I saw that Saturday, when I, when I saw the women stand up, I saw God use the worst thing that I thought was going to take me out and would have destroyed me. I saw it change the whole atmosphere of a room. I saw the people when they were so dead and they were so scared and so I've had it, I've gone through enough that I was able to bring hope. I was able to say, it's not over. That I shall live and not die to stand here and to declare the works of the Lord. That God truly works all things for good. That I don't have to walk in shame. But I can walk. I can walk. And God, in the midst of my enemies, in the valley of the shadow of death, he's prepared that table for me. And I can feast my eyes on Jesus and keep myself focused and keep going. And give God praise. I hurt the devil something terrible on Saturday. And that's what God wants you to do. The devil's got a headache and it should have your name written all over it. Why? Because I'm not going to stop. Because whatever you hit me with, I am determined, God, if you brought me to this thing, I'm not going to second guess and say, God, did I miss it? Is this the wrong door? Did I make a mistake? And that's why now I'm, I'm all of a sudden I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in this place because I made a mistake. I made this thing happen. And listen, sometimes we do make choices in life that certain circumstances will come upon us because of it. But God is greater than your mistake. God is the God of the turnaround. And the devil, he says, listen, Joseph said, he goes, you meant it for evil. You meant it to take me out. You meant this whole thing being thrown in the pit and the prison and my brothers betraying me and going through everything that I went through. You meant it to destroy me. But now I'm healed and my enemy has come before me. And I'm not taking vengeance on them. Why? Because I don't, I don't need to get any joy, having joy when I see my enemy going through their thing. Why? Because I've been touched by God in such a way that I say, my God, if you've done this for me, you can do this for everybody. And you've put your love in my heart. And I want everybody to feel and know who you are like I know who you are. Because me and Jesus, we got a thing going on. <laughs> because he is the very lover of my soul. And whatever Satan has thrown out there to try to destroy me, he's not been able to come close because I just keep bouncing back. Why? Because I've been praising my way through because I know that my Redeemer lives. So I've got to walk wise. Listen, we make mistakes, but you've got to be wise to what the devil is doing. To know that when you are in something... When you've walked through a door and the door doesn't look like the promise, or you might have gone into the wrong door, or you might have gone into the, op the halfway open door, and you might have gone in kind of the wrong way. You know, or sometimes, and we, we were talking in the back, sometimes, you know, there's that half open door and things can make sense logically and you can say, okay, this is the open door for this and I'm going to meet this person and you can think this person is for that connection because God is going to do this and God is going to do that. But God says, no, I put this person and that situation and this here because I'm teaching you how to do something for another door that you will receive that. Remember, God talks in the abstract. That's why he says, you need to trust me. I'm not telling you why I'm doing everything, but I have ordered your steps and I have also allowed room for the mistakes I knew you were going to make God knew when you were going to get rebellious 
God knew when you were going to choose the wrong path. God knew when you were going to listen to him. It's all in the pages. And guess what? You can't, write the, you can't rewrite the pages. Then the next verse, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The word redeem, it means to buy back from the marketplace. When it's talking about time, it's talking about a kairos time, not a chronos time. Chronos is what we live inside of our time, 24 hours a day. Kairos is God is outside of time. So the days are evil, meaning that we are living in desperate times. And many times what the enemy will do is he will make us feel like we've lost time. Did you ever make a mistake and you feel like, my God, if I could do that again and I've wasted so much time and so many years in this? God is saying here, listen, now that you're mine and all those mistakes you make, all the years that the locusts have eaten, he says, I'll restore them back to you. He says, I redeem the time. All of those years that you lost, it could be years, but in one moment, in one, I mean, blink of an eye, everything can change. He redeems, he buys back the time. That's why he says, listen, things are for an appointed time. They go into Kairos moments and not Kronos moments. We get stuck hour by hour, hour time. My biological clock is ticking. God, I'm getting too old for this. I'm getting too old to have a ministry. How am I going to travel? How am I going to do that? Listen, if God's promised it, he will work it out. Remember, um, Abraham and Sarah. God promised them Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. But they didn't want to wait. And they come up with this idea. They decide to help God out. And Abraham lays with Hagar. And they get, they, they get Ishmael. Now you would think, okay, well now you got your Ishmael, so now I'm not going to give you your Isaac because you didn't, you know, you didn't do what I said. No. God says, I got a plan. I promised you and I promised Sarah you would have a son. I promised you. And what I promise, I bring to pass. What I promise, I'm able to perform. Now that's the father of our faith people who messed up and messed up really big. And there's some really big consequences that we are facing still today because of that mistake that they made back then. But they still got their promise. God spoke a word over them. His word went forth like seed, and it did not return to them void. It did not matter that she was 90 years old. It didn't matter. Because God says, I don't live and I don't work according to your schedule. I don't work in your way. I don't work the way your mind works. I keep switching things up and I keep doing radical things to keep you sharp, to keep you learning how to walk and to hear my voice. You know, you know for yourself that when everything is going right and everything is going well, you are not seeking God the same, with the same intent and the same urgency and the same passion as you are when you are in trouble. That's the way it is for the majority of people. Until you've gone through enough stuff and you learn the lesson and you go, Lord, all I want is your presence. And you learn how to worship, why? Because you've made that mistake. You've made that mistake of not worshiping. 
And you see, God will allow you sometimes to let the walls of worship go down just so you can see who you really are without him. And when you've made enough mistakes like that, when you've been through enough fire like that, it will change you. It will renew your mind that before you begin to complain, you will start to praise. Because you will have practical experience. Don't want to go there anymore. And the only way I'm getting out of this thing is I'm taking my hands off of it. I'm putting it in God's hands. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask God, how is he going to bring me through this? The days are evil. The, the times are desperate. We are living in desperate times. I mean, not only in the world, but in our own private lives. Things have gotten desperate. But God is promising you, walk smartly. Be, 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 be vigilant. Be, be on the wall. Be sober about it. Ask me. Ask me for wisdom. But have no fear because I'll redeem the time. Listen, you made a mistake before you got into this building tonight, but God says today's the day of salvation, and I will save you out of this thing. Once you, once you realize what it is that you've learned, you are now armed with knowledge and experience. Knowledge and experience in God always creates a higher level of intimacy and trust. When you realize what God has done and how he's brought you through, you're able to trust him more when you encounter the next situation. Your experience and your testimony can very well end up helping someone else through what they're going through. And I saw it. I, I saw it several times this week in my life. So, so many times we live in that land of regret Man, I guess I didn't walk through that door. And we think, did I miss God? And my whole point tonight is, no, you can't. You really can't miss God. Well, you can miss God, but God will never miss you. Because you're a word that he spoke. And if you don't end up doing what he's truly promised and what he's spoken over you, that makes God a fool. That makes God a liar. Doesn't that give you a little bit of help tonight? To know that my life is truly in your hands. God, you spoke this thing over me. You know, I, I, I know I didn't touch myself and started to sing. I know that I did not call myself to ministry. If I could call myself, and I, I would have been on a beach somewhere. I would have been laying in a spa. I would have had a lot of money. I would have had a lot of other things. I, 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 would, not, I would not be going through all that I've been through. I know I did not pick this, but I know God's got a plan and an awesome plan for my life. He will, um, you know, he will redeem the time. The only opportunities that we truly miss are brilliant opportunities disguised as impossible situations. Every brilliant opportunity is always disguised by an impossible situation. Every impossible situation that God allows to come into your life is a brilliant, awesome, wonderful opportunity to see God show up and show off. Learning through difficult seasons are the most valuable thing that God gives us. He strengthens us. We become more aware of who he is. And I love this. The enemy is the instigator in the process that leads you to a greater blessing. The enemy is the instigator in the process that leads you to a greater situation. Satan instigates you, he, he irritates you, he try to push you. I preached a sermon years ago, the devil's got you right where God wants you. 
Because the one thing that God loves to do is he loves making a fool out of the devil. You know, because the devil, he's a bully. Always yelling and screaming about what he's going to do. Trying to twist your mind, take you out, do all this. And God laughs. The Bible, the Bible says it. God laughs at the enemy. God looks at him and says, are you a nut? You going to do this again? Have you not learned? Only one, the only one who really never learns from his mistakes is Satan. Because he keeps, I mean, one thing I'll give him is he is definitely consistent. He is definitely consistent. But he always fails. Why? Because God spoke a word over your life. You can make your plans. And this is something that, you know, that, that, I, that we need to lift off the spirit of condemnation. Because so many times, you know, we're in a situation now. And sometimes you're living in a circumstance that might have been caused by a choice that you made before. And, 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 and Satan loves that spirit of condemnation. And he loves to talk to you and say, you know what? If you only would have done what they told you. When that person said to me, I should have listened to you. It broke my heart. And I so wanted to just start preaching. God's got it all in hand. God, God knew it. So God's got it under control. And your ladder is going to be greater than your past. God's going to bring something, something mighty out of this thing. That you were not a victim to this circumstance that happened to you. He said your ladder is going to be greater than your past. I don't know how God's going to do that. I don't know how God's going to bring good out of it. I don't know how God's going to change it. And that's not for me to know, but I just know that he will. Why? Because I know, I know the word of God. Whatever the devil has stolen in your life, especially when it comes, comes to time, God says, I'm going to buy it back. I've redeemed the time for you. Things are for an appointed time. They're for an appointed season. But while you're in that hallway and God is showing you that door, you don't have to make the same mistakes. And you don't have to live under condemnation. And you don't have to back up and redo the door. Because here's the thing I've learned about. I've, I've learned about opportunities. Maybe the same exact opportunity will not come around. But a greater opportunity will. Because when the enemy gets caught, when the thief is cough, caught, he not only has to return what he stole, but he's got to return it seven times more. So when God says that, if you missed an opportunity that might have been this big, God will parade another opportunity that's this big. Because now you can handle the this big opportunity. Why? Because you've learned. And as you've been learning, you've been going you know, sometimes you feel like you're going around and around and around the mountain. But sometimes when you're in that hallway, it's like a staircase. You know, it, you, you're going around and around and around. But as you're going, you're going up higher and higher and higher. Because sometimes we get frustrated because we don't feel like we're making progress. I got to tell you something. I knew that I've made a lot of progress and God did a lot of work in me. And there's been times where I felt like, you know, God, I just feel like I haven't, I haven't like graduated yet. I'm not in the next place. But I knew who I used to be. And there was a part of me that would have been like, yeah, you should have listened to me. I was right. But that was not who I was. I got in the car and you can ask my husband. I started crying. And I have not stopped speaking about that, that, uh, that night. And I'm like, we serve a God that we don't have to live with regret. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day. I messed up today. I get it right tonight. I messed up five minutes ago, but next 10 minutes, I'll get it right. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Might feel like a waste of time, but God will bring back 
the opportunities. God will not be mocked. He will do what he promised to do. He's a faithful, faithful God. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's offering time.